So today we finally get into talking about all the different kinds of drugs that are out there, and there's probably more than are, than are in the notes. Um, so it's just a ton of information. So don't worry about trying to copy down everything today. It's going to just be a survey of the different kinds of drugs that are encountered in, uh, as evidence in a crime. And most of the crimes, by a long shot, uh, have something to do with drugs. Uh, even violent crime is probably over money related to drugs. Uh, a lot of the rapes and sexual assaults are drug facilitated. So the, one of the number one evidence volume items is drugs of some sort. So today we're not just going to talk about the drugs in their chemical form, but also uh, classifying them by origin, classifying them by effect, classifying legally by what schedule they're on, and so on. So it's just going to be an overview of drugs. And then that when we get to their effects, we need to talk about toxicology, so human anatomy and pharmacology. Uh, so how the drug is absorbed in the body, how it's distributed, and how it's metabolized and eliminated. Um, this is just a short view of that. So I call it baby talks or baby pharma. It's not the full picture. There's whole courses in that of metabolism and so on. But we're just going to touch on those topics. So. so like I said, don't try to scribble everything down. Um, I'll definitely, you know, shine a light on something that says, okay, you need to know this. And so I typically try to put a star in the notes too as well. So forensic scientists are classifiers. And so anytime you have an evidence, you're wanting to classify it. You're wanting to put it in different bins. Uh, it's just one large Venn diagram. And what you want to do is eventually isolate all of that evidence to a particular claim, either relating to a defendant or, you know, ex exonerating them. You know, you have no bias in the, in the the uh, analysis. It will either, it'll be classified however it's classified and then the prosecutor and the defense will decide on how that feeds into their case. Okay, but as far as classification, let's just take this biological example. Notice how the, the uh, classification or categories get smaller and smaller and smaller until they end, they're individualized. And so this would be related to a particular person. But when we're dealing with any kind of biological evidence, then that requires pharmacology and toxicology. So we'll get into that. That's why that's put into this set of notes. So let's talk a little bit about toxicology. Uh, this is the most basic premise of toxicology, that the toxin is the dose. My kids have that down now, you know. So you've got the, what is it, the six-second rule, or is it now a three, or is it ten-second rule? What do you all use? Five-second rule, okay, five-second rule. Well, my kids just reach down and grab and say, toxin is the dose. And so they think, if it didn't get very much dirt on it, then it's not toxic. <laughs> and I say, that doesn't always work with bacteria, because you know? <laughs> they grow. <laughs> so yeah, it's not probably, the dirt's not very toxic, because you've got a tiny little dose on your food. But if it's, you know, bacteria, then you've got a problem. So let's talk about drugs. Drugs are a general classification that... Uh, or any substance that creates a physiological change. And they're dosed to maximize that activity, but also to minimize the risk of adverse effects. So these are absorbed in many different ways, ingested, injected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll look at roots of entry later on today. Now, poison is just an overdosed drug. And a drug is anything that causes a physiological change. So that's a very broad definition. Medicines are not just the drugs, the active ingredient, but also all the other formulary components, like the binders that hold it together in a tablet form and allow it to be shipped. I mean, you'd hate to have crummy tablets that don't hold together because you open it at your house and you look in and it's a bunch of busted tablets. That's pretty rare. I mean, they put a lot of science into making sure these things are robust and can be shipped. And even then, they stick the little cotton ball in there to provide some cushion. <laughs> And then these definitions of drugs of abuse change over time. We're seeing right now the biggest shift in one of these definitions, and that is the changing definitions of whether marijuana is a controlled substance or not. And so right now we're in a real pickle in terms of federal, it's scheduled as a, as a Schedule One drug, no medical use and the harshest penalties, and yet in states like Colorado and Oregon and Washington that it's it's available for recreational use. So these definitions of drugs of abuse change over time, and we're seeing that happening right now. Now, this is probably the best evidence for the toxin is the dose, and that is even water. So water does 
create a physiological change. If you're dehydrated, you get headaches, you, you know, you're lethargic. Um, but if you're overhydrated, can you be overhydrated? Well, this shows yes. Substituting water for drinking games has been done at certain colleges and fraternities and other kinds of uh, organizations because they thought, well, we know we can't use alcohol for hazing anymore, so we'll just haze with water and make them drink a ton of water. Well, that 21-year-old student in UC Chico died. He was hazed with water. And it diluted his bloodstream enough that the electrical signals were not strong enough for his central nervous system to function. And he died of, uh, I guess, heart failure. And then also the most tragic one that I know of is a 28-year-old mother of three died trying to get a wee. There was this, this Chicago radio station that was running this, um, this um, contest to, called Hold Your Wee for a Wee. So they would drink water, and it was, uh, it was deionized or distilled water. It was very pure water, so it didn't have a lot of sodium in it. And as she drank it, she started getting headaches and so on, and she didn't even win. She came in second and then drove home and died of heart failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the news um, report here. So, come on. so even water can kill you, and this is you know, now a famous case. Do you have any nice water tastes horrible? Who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> exactly. And I, again, I think it was just um, like the, I think it was distilled water, but it was still very low in iron content. Mm -hmm. uh, now you can get this uh, surprisingly easily uh, by super exertion. Like if you're hiking across the mountains in Colorado or you know what have you, and you're sweating all the time and you're not drinking stabilized water that has uh, ions in it or electrolytes like Gatorade, but if you're just drinking distilled or deionized water, or not deionized, but distilled water, then you can get hyponatremia without drinking a whole bunch of water. If you're sweating out your salt, you're not replacing it, you get hypo, low, natremia. Natrium is sodium. That's what Na is. So hyponatremia is a problem for some athletes, and that's why they put all the, the electrolytes in. And, and it's not going to work. That's okay, but you have that link. Um, it worked on my computer upstairs. It'll work on yours. So if you can look at this, you can see the, the news report of the jury. They awarded the... Um, the father and the three boys, uh, $16.6 million in retaliation, I guess, for the radio station running this contest, this dangerous contest. There's other ways to classify drugs. You could classify them by origin or chemical nature. So, you know, acid base character is great for chemists. You know, we see uh, opiates, we see that. <laughs> tertiary amine, and we say, ah, that's a base. But that doesn't mean anything to a jury, okay? And so we talk about the different origins, whether it's a plant extract, an alkaloid, uh, or semisynthetic, like heroin being made from morphine. Morphine's a plant extract, so it's an alkaloid, but then heroin's a semisynthetic. You have to go through a process of adding acetyl groups onto those OH groups and morphine to make heroin. They thought it would be less addictive, and they messed up. It's more addictive. <laughs> so... Um, and then other kinds of synthetic drugs like diazepam or Valium is 100% made in the lab. And then you have now experimental or designer drugs, which is kind of a catch-all for all other kinds of categories. And one that's currently growing in terms of uh, evidence is bath salts. Have you all heard of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what have you heard about it? Because I have, it's kind of new to me. It's just that it's... Yeah, have you seen them? Have you ever seen this? Where have you seen it? On the news. Oh, just on the news, okay. But I mean, I've heard that you can buy these things because they're the legality. It's hard to keep up with things that are being abused, and since they're sold as bath salts, I mean, that's just you put it in the bath, right? Yeah. Well, it's, so I've, I've heard. The same. I know they're not the same, but I'm saying they could be marketed as the same. Yeah, and so you could see them like in a store or what have you, and not know, oh, that's a drug of abuse that people are actually eating that stuff. You know. Um, that's also dangerous too when you market a drug as some other kind of product that's a real product like Epsom salt. You could have somebody eat Epsom salt and that's not going to give them any, <coughs> any drug related high but it's going to kill them because they're going to have too much sodium and too much um, magnesium in their blood. Yes. I think Karen mentioned that a few years ago that um, we 
the U.S. Congress, they actually, like, in order to make a drug illegal, and it's a designer drug, you have to prove that it's a drug, and you have to have, like, a couple years of evidence of the yeah. drug. And people are making, like, 100 new designer drugs every year. Right. Whereas Texas law actually states if it's this class of drug, it's illegal. Yeah, that's great. So they'll they'll loop in whole classes of of molecules, and so that's I think that's what they're doing. The bath salts are, are either cathinones or cathinone related substances, and that's a, a stimulant found in the cat plant. And so this is just a, a series of facts about the cathinones from this really nice website down here. So this is the drugabuse.gov. So that's a, a good place for you to find information on on drugs that it's not in the notes I just added this morning. <laughs> yeah, and so this is uh, they, uh, these different kinds of bath salts. They do look like Epsom salt, though. I was looking at some of the images, and it's, you know, coarse grains of organic salts, and uh, they swallow, smoke, snort, or inject them. Uh, the other thing that's interesting and that's scary to me is someone on these cathinones can, can exhibit paranoia, uh, but also these panic attacks and violent delusions. So when you're dealing with somebody in this in this state, rational discourse doesn't work, and that's the thing that always has scared me. Even since I was a little kid in like middle school, was this big bully guy was there, and he was talking about uh, how he likes to fight. And so this was on the playground. My buddy and I were listening in. And he goes, you know, sometimes when somebody tries to talk me out of fighting with them, it just makes me madder, and I just want to fight them more. And I was thinking, oh, dang, that was going to be my strategy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I figured I could talk somebody out of fighting. And uh, he was saying, no, that just makes me madder. I was like, oh, wow, that's not going to be good. <laughs> so the sort of paranoid delusion and violent, violent behavior, you know, with someone on a drug, that's, that's really terrifying to me because they're not up for rational discourse, you know. Fighting me is not going to get you anywhere, you know. It doesn't matter to them. They're like, no, I'm ready to go. And so you see some of those uh, kinds of violent attacks, uh, and that's what makes policing such a difficult job. So you can also classify these drugs by their effect. So what are the physiological consequences that they have? That's, that's why water is not classified as a drug. It's beneficial, but you could turn it into a toxin by, by drinking way too much. But you have different kinds of effects. You have pain relief, which is analgesic, so these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and Aleve. Uh, that's the, the uh, that's the active ingredient in the in Aleve and uh, naproxen sodium. And then you also have the really powerful ones, the opiates, morphine, codeine, etc. Depressants that attenuate the central nervous system. Barbituric acid or benzodiazepams or ethanol. Ethanol is probably the most common uh, depressant that's used. And as a kid, I remember thinking in health class in high school, why would anybody take a drug that makes them feel depressed? <laughs> but it's not making you feel depressed, it's depressing your central nervous system, which a lot of times depresses the feelings of anxiety. And so these, uh, you can imagine in today's world where anxiety is, is rampant, that people are drawn to ethanol, but also even stronger drugs. Then you have hallucinations. A lot of times a hallucination is just an altered perception of time, but you also have, you know, hallucinating uh, things that really are not in the room. Uh, a lot of times people who are, are uh, what they call tweaking or twitching, they're scratching imaginary bugs, they feel like bugs are crawling on them, and so if you see that behavior, that's someone to avoid or get help. And then we have narcotics. Uh, they do uh, pain relief and also depress the central nervous system, and these are the opioids. And then stimulants like cocaine, etc., will stimulate the central nervous system. You could also classify them by use. So there's uh, what they call date rape drugs, or more more technical drug facilitated sexual assault drugs. Alcohol also being the number one uh, DFSA. Uh, but also Rufi or ketamine or GHB. These kind of club drugs <coughs> supposedly take you a, a you know, alcohol's not good enough, and so they have these other drugs to give them a higher um, buzz. And 
probably heard of ecstasy. Uh, LSD is also a hallucinogen, and PCP is a very, very strong psychoactive drug. And then you also, not everything is made to get somebody high. You have uh, performance enhancing drugs as evidence. And so those, those would be a, a classification that's very useful to, to put it in either a human performance drug or a club drug or, you know, one of the um, psychoactive drugs. And then you have inhalants. So gasoline is gasoline, but it also could be used as a drug. And so you might have evidence where this gasoline was used as a drug. Nail polish, paint thinner. Uh, we were, where were we when we just bought something and Thomas couldn't buy it because he's not 18. It wasn't super good. It might have been Sharpies. Yeah, it was something surprising. I was like, what? They're like, we're going to let him buy it. You know, and they, uh, they pointed to me. And I was like, oh, okay. So then I bought it. But, you know, he put it on the counter and I'm like, we're going to let him buy it. And I was like, Sharpies? <laughs> yeah. And so then you could also classify them by schedule. So these would be the legal definitions of the drugs. So uh, these drugs of abuse are subject to regulation. Look at the range of fines. So if uh, schedule one, zero to 20 years, and uh, zero to a million dollar in fines. So those are the, the most regulated schedule one drugs. Schedule five, zero to one year, or zero to a $100,000 fine. So like... <coughs> Schedule five is just over-the-counter stuff. <coughs> and so, again, the, the full range of uh, punishment is zero, zero up to these one year and $100,000 fine for the Schedule five. And so you need to take into account what they call the totality of circumstances. I mean, possessing codeine cough syrup is not punishable if you have a prescription and you have the amount that was prescribed. But they come into your house and you got 400 bottles, you know, and no prescription. Then it's, it's a Schedule Five drug, but you've got a lot of it. So there's a crime, you know, that's evidence of something fishy. And so, but even then it's a Schedule Five. It's not, you're not, you don't have packets of cocaine or a truckload of marijuana. Okay. What's interesting about that is this right here. We have marijuana as a Schedule One, which is, uh, listed as no medical use and severe addiction, and it's up there with heroin, um, you know, uh, ecstasy, LSD, and GHB. And so this is, like I said, a really interesting time legally because we have states that say it's okay and the federal government says it's not. And, I mean, what do you think about that? Let's discuss that for a little bit. Yes? For, like, Anecdote like my roommate, they caught a guy on camera stealing seven hundred dollars out of her purse because she was trying to like open up a bank account so she had wow. money on it. Okay. And um, the DA did not prosecute because they were dealing with so many marijuana cases and it was like you know like two ounces of marijuana. Uh huh. Yeah. And so she never got that money back even though they caught him on camera. Yeah, and so it was just. Having it as a Schedule One just overwhelms the DEA. Yeah, in that situation. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Well, my husband's a cop, mm -hmm. actually, and most of the time, if the DEA, it depends on the DEA, but most of the time, if he like, if they happen to find marijuana in something, but it's less than like three ounces, mm -hmm. they won't even bother calling the DEA because the DEA is going to say, "We're not going to take it." Yeah, because they have too many other things. Too many to other about. things. Yeah, <laughs> and and notice the full range. Let's say, okay, the person's convicted, they've got three ounces. The full range is zero to 20 and zero to a million, right? So it's likely it's going to be zero, zero, but you've still used all of those resources, the legal resources. But what about the difference between state law and federal law? So instead of, you know, these are practical person to person level and DA level issues that y'all brought up, and those are great. That's where the rubber meets the road. But we still have this issue between federal law and state law. What do we do with that? I mean, technically, federal is supposed to trump state law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, that's why the state, state agencies can't do anything about it. Federal, that's why federal agencies go into those states if they have it. It wouldn't cost. Because only federal agencies can do it in those states. But isn't it strange? We have states flaunting federal law. Are you all okay with that? 
I'm just curious. I want to see what you think because y'all are students with a different perspective. I think it's more of a dumb debate because the whole war on marijuana came, came with the whole war on drugs mm -hmm. thing when it was passed. And it was just another thing to do mainly. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think when the whole war on drugs thing happened, like some medicines still had like morphine <coughs> and heavy opiates in it. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just to if memory serves to, what was it? You're too strong on marijuana? Is that yeah, kind of what you're saying? Yeah, it was to just throw poor people in jail, frankly. Oh, it's, it's practical effect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and no offense to anybody, black people, um, because racist. Okay, is, so the um, law in itself was racist or could be construed that way, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? So if you think about it, marijuana is the only thing on that list that's not synthetic. And the fact that marijuana also has been with human culture for the beginning of time, mm -hmm. and we find it everywhere, the fact that we ban it now, but like if you go to other countries that do have marijuana, it's seen as like a young kid's drug. Mm -hmm. And so like most of the time it's just young people throwing their lives away by like smoking marijuana and getting caught with it. And so we have this like off balance of like age discrepancy, I guess. Okay, so it's hitting races differently, it's hitting ages differently. Also getting food. getting put in jail at a young age is, I mean, have y'all seen Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. Anyway, the point was he, he was innocent, he got thrown in jail, but then being in jail turned him into a criminal. Like he figured out how he could help. He was an accountant, so he helped the warden do bad things. And and the point was, he was like, being in jail made him a, a criminal, even more so. He went in innocent and came out a criminal. Um, that, you know, that's just one, it's a movie, of course. But, um, but so different, it hits different populations. But I'm still pulling on that thread that I, that I that is an interesting thread, and that is, can a state just flaunt federal law. It depends on how the Constitution is written, and then, if I remember correctly, the Constitution doesn't have anything like the government can't regulate that specific thing, so therefore it goes to the states, even though obviously the federal government lobbies yeah, shouldn't. Yeah, but they have but regulated. They, have, they right, regulated these drugs right, nationwide. So constitutionally, since it says that the government doesn't have technically say over that, then uh -huh. it goes to the states. Yeah, but, and so we've kind of we've marched down this way, which would be yes, but there's still yeah. there's still debate about that too. So. If this is sort of the federal state debate, you know, can states regulate things more independently from the federal government? It's in this particular thing I've I've noticed sort of this slide towards what we would call states' rights in terms of marijuana legislation. Okay, so I, that's that's one end of the pendulum. Okay, what about I'm going to change the law. We're not talking about drugs anymore. We, the issue is not what we're regulating, but how do we balance state versus federal regulation? So that's the topic. But I'm going to change what we're talking about. It's not drugs anymore. It's abortion. Mm -hmm. What if Texas, a very conservative state, said, we're going to outlaw it? Do you see the conundrum? That's definitely something people say, no, federal government says, but states could say, and I'm not promoting either one, I'm saying we, we slide towards marijuana and states' rights because we think, oh, you know, it's disproportionate, we have all these reasons to support states doing what they want to do. Then you pick an issue that you may feel strongly a different way, the federal government has precedent, and now what do we do? So. That's something I'm not trying to settle for you, but you're going to have to settle this. This is the country you're getting. And are you going to get a states' rights country? Or are you going to get a federalism country? How are you going to work this out? Because we're creating a mess right now when states just flaunt the federal government. The other things are going to be flaunted as well. So it's something that y'all will need to chew on. I just wanted to sort of increase the heat a little bit in your mind about Marijuana, not so much focusing on marijuana as the drug or the topic, but federal versus state law. It's, it's starting to get messy. I mean, it's always been messy. We fought a civil war over it. Don't
Okay. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, it's a messy topic. Yes. Um, I feel like at some point soon it's probably going to come to a head of the Supreme Court. Yeah, I'm sure it will, yeah. And so we've kind of set the nine justices of the Supreme Court sort of as our, as our kings and queens to say, what do the nine people say, you know, and, and if that works for our country and keeps us united, I guess that's good, but I really wish Congress would do its job. That's my personal opinion there, that Congress would iron these things out sooner rather than later. But that's, that's very difficult. Uh, so that's where we are. I'm not, again, I'm not uh, pushing for or against, but I do want you to realize there's a deeper issue than just marijuana. It's the state versus federal um, uh, regulation system. Yes? Is the opposite of growth, then is Congress the opposite of progress? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's good. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And then I think it was Mark Twain, he said, one useless man is a tragedy, a hundred useless men is a Congress. <laughs> so, anyway, that's Mark Twain for you. So, now, they've done a lot of research. I just saw this in my popular science magazine. I was like, that's a crazy picture, so I took it from this class. But uh, they've done research on where these different drugs hit the different places in the brain, and so you can find all kinds of neat information about the different receptors. Now, this is a, this is a graphic probably made by uh, an artist in popular sciences place, but you do have some things uh, uh, related to opiates and, and these sort of uh, deep centers related to pain and, and deadening pain, um, but I thought it was an interesting deal. And my point is that you can find out, uh, pulling the thread in, in reputable journals, not necessarily popular science, where these different drugs do their business in the brain. Now let's talk about the evidence surrounding the drugs. And this is a nice uh, handy device, the five P's. So you have powders, not just white powders, but tarry, oily, odiferous goo. Um, so goo is not really a powder, but you could say it's not a powder. <laughs> so it's still a P. It's a powder or a goo. Um, you have plant matter, like GPLM, general or green plant-like material, or uh, green vegetative material, GBM. And these are not just marijuana, there's other kinds, like you were saying, other kinds of substances that have been with mankind since mankind. And they uh, are the mushrooms and the cactus buttons and stuff. Now, uh, a lot of this stuff hasn't been preserved well, and so it turns to mold and goo, and, and so you might get an evidence of something that's been sitting in the back of a trunk or what have you for quite a while. And you've got to figure out, is this goo some drug material? Yes. Under moldy goo, too. What if someone had some like ergot mold? <laughs> yeah, I don't what know. Would that be? Yeah, and so it, it would be, this would be the tricky part of the forensic scientist's job is trying to figure out, okay, how do I extract the analyte from this, and what kind of interference are going to be there? Um, so drugs that interfere with your signal, are you going to get a lot of compounds from the mold, and are those going to elute? Or are they going to behave pH-wise like my analyte? And so this could be tricky. Now, I think those would be the exciting things. You know, just running 400 urine samples a day may not be so exciting. But getting some moldy goo in a plastic sack and remembering your old professor and saying, you know, this might be catnip. I'm not going to assume this person's guilty. <laughs> Who has catnip under their car seat? Well, this guy did. <laughs> yeah. And then pills. This is one of your favorite things. So you get a pill with a mark on it, it's a certain color or a certain shape, you go to the physici physician's desk reference. And so that'll be definitely on your shelf, which has all the different pills that, that are marketed commercially. And then they also have a clandestine desk reference that has um, you know, large outfits that produce uh, drugs of abuse, you know, ecstasy tablets, Sometimes they put their own little markings on there, like a dragon or something like that. And so then you, they tell you who, you know, what pills they manufacture. And if you get the, one of those clandestine desk references that has all of the drugs of abuse from the large uh, drug dealers, then you'll be able to look up some of those. Yeah, this is the same ecstasy that was marketed in Houston. It has a dragon on it, you know, and so then you know kind of where it came from. And then precursors, all of the stuff that, that uh, is used in the synthesis of the drugs. Some of these are listed, uh, you know, in the, in the law because of their uh, implications. 
And then paraphernalia, the equipment of abuse, the syringes, the cookers, bongs and clips and stuff. So those are your five Ps. And then you have the different evidence exhibits, the actual stuff that comes in as evidence. The top four are the green material like marijuana, methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. You also get some of these uh, analogs of PCP, this green solution with an overwhelming smell. <laughs> and then in Halloween, I remember this as a, as a high school kid, it was terrifying. Somebody got some apples with razor blades in them. And I mean, just people, man, there's some messed up people in this world. And so during Halloween, you've got, uh, sometimes you've got, uh, you know, like medical imaging places, say, bring your candy and we'll run it through the x-ray and determine if there's anything wrong with it. I'd rather just throw it out from the collect. But this is the regional differences in 2007. I found this on that, uh, that uh, drugabuse.gov site. And these are the different clandestine uh, labs by region. So if you look here, we've got it might be hard for you to see, but over here, the blue is cocaine, the orange is heroin, the red is methamphetamine, green is marijuana, and then ecstasy is in pink. This is really not much activity in ecstasy, but look at the big differences between cocaine in the southeast and methamphetamine in pretty much all of the west. Okay. Um, heroin up here in the northeast. Now, the, this is 2007. I guarantee that this has really changed with marijuana being legalized in Colorado and other places because now you have commercial farms moving in and they're, they're uh, growing marijuana in, in great quantities. Okay. And so here's an example of how small you can fit a meth lab. This is a trunk of a car. And so you could pull up, pull all your gear out, run your organic synthesis finally do the filtration, dry it, and then you've got product to sell. And it can all fit in the trunk of a car. Yeah. Wouldn't quite fit in your drawer upstairs, you know, in the little, <laughs> if you had six drawers, you could have a meth lab. We had in Oregon, somebody had tried to steal, steal glassware, you know, for meth lab, yeah, so, interesting. But yeah, this, can you imagine the smell of that trunk? Because you got all those solvents and everything. A lot of the results, they deal with ammonia, and so people will talk about their neighbor's house smelling like cat pee really badly, because cat pee, you know, it'll turn into ammonia, urea, uric acid will turn into ammonia. And so a lot of times it's not that they have a ton of cats, it's that there's drugs being manufactured there. And then there's the non-drug components. You have cutting agents, which you can use to classify the different formulations. Okay. You can use uh, the excipients. These are things like the, the, the binding powders, the starch, um, you know, coffee creamer, things like that that are used to bind it together. You know, and uh, let's see, we didn't press any pellets in PKM1. In PKM2, we do uh, bomb calorimetry where you put your powder in there and you press a pellet. Some things press into pellets very well and others don't. Did you do starch? Did you? Uh -huh. Did it press well? Yeah. yeah, so starch is one that's, that's commonly used because it's non-toxic, and yet it presses really well. It'll, it'll make a good ta tablet. And then adulterants, things used to max the abs mask the absence of the drug. Like uh, if you're going to try to stretch the cocaine, you can put in caffeine because it's also a stimulant. And then these impurities may show up that are not intentionally added, and, and they may help the crime lab identify the region where this stuff came from. And then this is an interesting one, using solvent residue as evidence. A little more tricky to detect this because a lot of times you set your GC runs up to ignore the solvent. <laughs> okay, so you're going to have to figure out a way to detect the solvent because you normally ignore the first two minutes when the solvent flies off of the, off of the column and you're looking at the heavier or the higher boiling components. But you could use solvent to profile these things. In, in, in some cases, like in the US, 59% uh, of the cases, this was a survey done of crime labs, they had residual toluene in their cocaine uh, formulations. And, and they had uh, 
41% of those labs uh, reported that they detected dichloromethane and 55% detected benzene. Whereas in Switzerland, you can see propanol or isopropyl alcohol was reported in 17% of the cases. And so it's just sort of regional um, uses of the different solvents. Notice that uh, benzene is more common in Canada than in toluene. These benzene and toluene are probably related. Now that might actually be a toluene solvent, but benzene and toluene is also a component, a minor component in gasoline. And so if they're re recrystallizing from gasoline, then they're going to have benzene and toluene. If they're recrystallizing from, say, uh, dichloromethane or propanol, then they're, that's store-bought. So they're buying that solvent and using it. <clears throat> uh, dichloromethane is uh, paint thinner, and so they're recrystallizing from paint thinner. So now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the pharmacology basics and toxicology and how the drugs interact with the body, how they enter the body, and how they leave. Um, and so this, this studies the, uh, how the drug interacts with the body, uh, what the drug does, and the effects it causes, how it moves through the body, and then this right here, I put a star by, because this is the acronym that you need to know. So this is the baby toxicology. The, the substance is absorbed, not adsorbed. Adsorbed would be like sunscreen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's absorbed. Okay. It's distributed through the body. And what is the distribution medium for the body? The bloodstream. So it's aqueous. It goes through the body using an aqueous distribution. Then it's metabolized. Do you know where metabolism takes place in the body? Liver and kidneys. There's two places and and so some drugs will will be hard on the liver, meaning they'll metabolize by the liver, and if you overdose on them or use too much, then the liver is working quite strongly on that. Um, you don't want to overwhelm your liver, but you also don't want to overwhelm your kidneys. And so that's why, and you'll find this out if you start a family, little kids, um, Tylenol is metabolized where? Do you know this? Liver. Liver and ibuprofen? kidneys okay so a child uh, you can use children's Tylenol and, ch and children's ibuprofen alternating wise so you don't overwhelm their liver and so they're fever reducers so a little child's teething they're not sick they don't have a, a f they don't have a, a an infection okay but they've got a high fever you want to bring that fever down you can use Tylenol six hours and really get, you shouldn't give it to them again for another 12 hours so you do six hours of Tylenol and then you give them ibuprofen and so the Tylenol is being metabolized by the liver, and then you give them ibuprofen, and that's being metabolized by the kidneys. Six hours later, it's been 12 hours since they've had Tylenol. So then you come back with Tylenol, and then you come back with ibuprofen. And so you can reduce the fever this way and not overwhelm either one of the systems for metabolism. The same goes for the pain relievers between uh, Aleve and Advil. Aleve and Advil. So you, you can, can do this. Aleve, and then you can take an Advil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, the, the thing that you've got to be aware of and for yourself too, although you're bigger, so that you can, your liver's bigger, your liver has more capacity than, a, than an infant. Uh, but you need to worry about cough medicines like, uh, uh, like NyQuil contain everything under the sun. You know, they've got cough suppressant, expectorant, and pain reliever. So they'll have Tylenol in them. And then if you take a Tylenol, you've essentially taken a double dose of Tylenol. It's not a great thing to do pretty hard on your liver. And then you have elimination. So elimination is, uh, you know, fecal elimination or also urine. And then sweat. So it's sweat, urine, defecation. So you have those different ways of getting things out of your body. Uh, in extreme cases, elimination could be vomiting. You know, and so when they talk about stomach pumping, they just give you a drug that makes you vomit. So you throw it all up and get it out of your stomach. And that's, that's, an, that's trying to eliminate the absorption step. So you've absorbed it, you've ingested it, and they're like, let's undo that step. <laughs> so it doesn't get distributed and, and metabolized and so on. And so then a lot of times, what was it? Uh, was it in this past tense like that? Uh, you're analyzing the elimination, you're either analyzing the urine or so on, or if the person is deceased, you're analyzing any kind of fluids that you can get. Um, and one of the fluids that's a little difficult to deal with, but uh, is um, preserved really well is ocular fluid. 
so the fluid inside the eye. And so you can sample that fluid and, and get a profile in terms of what was ingested and what was distributed in the body. So these are the routes of entry. So it's not just ingestion. You can also inhale. Inhaling is probably, in terms of chemical exposure for the chem lab, you know, in organic, that's probably your largest route of exposure was inhaling. That's why I didn't like organic. <laughs> that's why I became a physical chemist. <laughs> and, uh, and then sublingual, have you seen those little breath strips and things? You put that under the tongue and it just disappears. And that's really fantastic. Uh, you can also do that for, uh, they make these sublingual tablets for, I think it's called fenugrin. It's an anti-nausea drug. Mm -hmm. It's great. You don't have to swallow it because you swallow it, you're going to throw it back up. <laughs> okay. Just put it on your tongue and it's supposed to make your nausea go away. Uh, they even have these little tabs you can put behind your ear for motion sickness, okay, and they, they go uh, right through the skin. So that would be transdermal. The nicotine patches are transdermal. They even have, I think, birth control patches, etc. Uh, then you have subcutaneous injection. The cutaneous layer is that fatty layer underneath your skin. And so you have your, you know, epidermis and dermis, and then you have this subcutaneous fat layer that makes your skin slide over your muscles. Okay. And then that, you can put a drug in there that's fat soluble and it will be released slowly over time. And then you have intramuscular where you just drive it into the muscle and then it slowly comes into the bloodstream. Now I did put this figure on here because I think this is fantastic. What's the difference between oral and injection? Well, this is a good example of plasma concentration, which we'll look at next, and this therapeutic window. So this therapeutic window is right here, and it's saying that if the concentration is between these two limits, then we get the best effect. So that's where you want the drug concentration to be for the best effect. If it's too higher than that, you, let's say it's binding to a protein or some enzyme, and uh, you've already bound to all the enzymes, and so if it's higher than that, it's not going to be used. So you have an upper limit to the therapeutic effect. If you go way beyond that, toxin is the dose, you've got an overdose. This is just saying it's above the therapeutic window, but below the toxic effects. And so that, that bit above is not always good. It's not really being used. It will be used as the concentration drops down. And so this talks about oral versus transdermal. So these pink lines are the oral. So you take the pill, it jumps up, it's above the therapeutic window, they give you a little more so that it'll come back down and be in that therapeutic window longer. If you just gave it enough to get into the therapeutic window, it would drop out fairly quickly and you wouldn't get as long of an effect. But you have these spikes and you take another pill four hours later or six hours later, you know, and then another pill and another pill. So this would be perfect. You're waking up in the middle of the night to take your pills. <laughs> okay. And so you're, you're taking these pills on a regular basis, but you see the area inside the therapeutic window is choppy. You have, you know, an effect, it goes away, an effect, it goes away, etc. And then this transdermal injection, it comes up, oh no, transdermal, the patch. You put the patch on and it, it comes to equilibrium with your bloodstream and then you have a constant dosing until the patch runs out. And so you have this therapeutic window that, that they've engineered the uh, patch to dose through the skin into the bloodstream to keep it at that therapeutic level. So that's fantastic. But there are certain things that can change the, um, uh, the transdermal pathways. Okay? Like if your skin is roughed up or whatever before you put the patch on, then you've got a problem because you, this is based upon good, healthy skin with a nice layer of fat and a nice layer of dead skin cells. And if it's scratched or abraded and you put that patch on, then it's going to be above the therapeutic window. Um, two things. What is two supposed to be? Or is that just two? Um, two I don't know. It's pointing to the lungs. Or the heart. I don't know. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's not labeled, so good question. Yeah. Uh, inter, you know, the others make sense. Transnasal, like you, you know, snorting cocaine. 
and interocular absorption. That's just getting something in your eye and then it going into the body. And secondly, there's a rather intro not labeled. Number two isn't. Yeah. Is that what you mean? No, there's a rather um Okay. On the diagram. Okay. Suppository. Yeah, suppository. That's right. Yeah. And so we have to draw that one in. Happens so. with drug smugglers and such. Yeah, that's right. But even also, um, uh, that's also a, um, <laughs> a um, route of entry for like um, anti-nausea or anti-diarrheal for mm -hmm. kids. Again, you can't get them to uh, swallow something. And so then they have these suppositories that you just put in there. Um, they're typically a wax, like a waxy plug, and the wax melts and releases the drug because it's at body temperature. And so um, it's not pleasant to talk about, but that's a, for the little children, that's a, that's a great thing because if you can't get them to swallow something or if they're so nauseous, they'll throw it back up, then um, you can put that little wax drug plug in there. Then down here, transdermal, I just showed the little cycle for... for uh, like hookworms, that's a that's a parasite, but again, it goes through your feet and gets in your bloodstream and then uh, ends up in your intestines and lays its eggs that show up in the uh, feces and then people walk barefoot on the feces and it's amazing. So this whole life cycle of hookworms is based on walking barefoot on dried feces. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty incredible that even even a parasite like that could go through your feet. And so naturally, drugs can go through your skin. It's a lot smaller than, than a hookworm egg. So, yeah, that's disgusting. So here's the whole ADME scheme. So you have some sort of exposure or ingestion. You have absorption. Now, the absorption depends upon bioavailability. Uh, that's, that's kind of what I was saying about... Uh, through transdermal, you know, it may not be able to get through a really thick and calloused place of skin. Okay, so it wouldn't be bioavailable. Another thing for ingestion drugs, if the particles are the wrong size, then they may not dissolve quickly enough and they end up in the, the large intestine and they end up being defecated out. So bioavailability is not just is the drug active in the body, but it may be the physical properties of that drug that make it available or not. But anyway, let's say they are bioavailable, they're absorbed, and then they go into the body and the distribution is, is the bloodstream. Even in a fat-soluble drug, some small amount of that is going to be soluble in the, in the bloodstream and it's going to go through and be distributed. It might be distributed slower and that may be what you want for that pharmacological uh, effect. Uh, storage, again, fat-soluble drugs are going to be stored in your fatty tissues. And even if it's not a drug, just things that you're in contact with in the environment are going to be stored in your fatty tissues. I bet if we sampled everybody in here, um, if you've eaten fish in your life, you've gotten exposed to polychlorinated biphenyls. Okay, these were, these were um, large inert molecules that were used for um, uh, like heat transfer in our electrical transformers, and those have been released into the environment. They're... Uh, carcinogenic maybe you know it's one of those things that, that some states would say like California yes it's carcinogenic other states would say no but but it bioaccumulates it's a big organic molecule with chlorines on it and it gets stuck in the fatty tissues and where is it going to accumulate first it's going to be in the rivers and streams down in the mud what eats mud catfish <laughs> catfish eat mud that's those PCBs end up in the fatty tissues of catfish we eat catfish, or at least I do. And so then I'm going to have those PCBs bioaccumulate in my fatty tissues. And so that's the storage part. Some of these molecules get stored with you for life. And so that's, uh, but, but many of them get metabolized, transformed in some way, either by the, by the kidneys or by the liver, and then eliminated. Now this distribution goes on and on and on, and so it just sort of leaks out, and there's... A uh, very nice model that we use, first-order kinetics. Now, some things may not be first-order, but you're going to start with first-order kinetics. And most of your metabolism systems are first-order. And so here's the first-order uh, kinetics for uh, absorption, distribution, and elimination and metabolism. If we go back, the reason I drew this blue line here to make it a little sharper, this was in the, in the old book. 
and it showed this sort of gradual climb and go up. This little gradual part is really overemphasized in this image, and so I just showed really it's more like a straight line up. And if we go back, look at this, you know, this is what's being shown here. This pink line, you know, it's absorption and distribution, metabolism and elimination. So absorption distribution is the shooting up part, metabolism and elimination is the coming down. And so that's what's being shown here. There are several homework problems related to this little uh, <coughs> equation up here. So we have the dose in milligrams. We have the body mass in kilograms. And so milligrams per kilogram is the dosing units that we deal with. And that's really important when you have an infant because you're supposed to give ibuprofen to bring the, heat, the, the fever down. But if you've got a preemie like we had, then you can't just use the bottle, right? Because the bottle's made for the eight pound baby or whatever the normal is, the average. And so I was in the pharmacy and I asked the pharmacist, What's, can you tell me what the level we should not over, you know, overshoot in a 24 hour period in milligrams per kilogram? And she was like, oh, no one ever asked me good questions like that. And so she said, just a minute. So she pulls out her reference books and is flipping through and she said, write this down for ibuprofen, write this down for Tylenol, you know, don't go over this. And so then I knew, okay, I've got a hard ceiling we can give her these things and her liver can handle it and not go over this amount in the 24 hour period. And so the time is, is important. You can go up to a certain amount and then in 24 hours you've eliminated it and you've sort of, but your body can handle it. It can be reset. And so this milligrams per kilogram is the dosing per kilogram. And then CP is the plasma concentration in milligrams per liter. So if you were to pull a sample of the blood spin it down to push the cells down to the bottom and sample the liquid above that, the plasma. This would be milligrams per liter of that drug. And this is the volume of distribution. It's the apparent volume of distribution, but most of the time it ends up being the, the liters per kilogram of your bloodstream. So, so how many, you, you know, you weigh, I uh, say, uh, like Thomas weighs 100 kilograms, you know, what what volume of blood is, is going to be in 100 kilograms? It's going to be rough, it would be close to uh, you know, 100 liters, a liter weighs a kilogram, but if it's less than that, that just means that it's not fully distributed over the whole body. Okay. If it's greater than that, maybe it's distributed into the fat tissues. Okay. And so that would be the parent volume of distribution. So working with this equation, we have several problems in the homework. Now this first order kinetics, you guys can do this. These are the first order kinetic equations. So for uh, absorption and distribution, you have this uh, T one half for the substance and then the time it takes to bring it into the body. And because it's a growing curve, not a decaying curve, it's one minus that. So one minus the decay would be the absorption. And then the, the elimination is just that exponential decay. The time, T one half, in the body. So this T1 and a half up here is the absorption half-life. And so you eat the drug and it, the, the concentration doubles uh, every half-life. And so it goes up to the maximum amount and then it starts to be eliminated where the concentration gets cut in half every half-life. And those are going to be two different half-lives. The elimination half-life is really the only one that you have to worry about. How long is the drug in the system? You can assume instantaneous absorption. So you're saying that that high flash up here is really small. And then this is the one you worry about. Now, what is it for alcohol? This is something you should know just in general to be a safe uh, drinker if you drink socially. What is your, your alcohol? You may not necessarily know the half-life, but what is a safe um, uh, assumption for metabolizing a drink of alcohol? Do you know this? This is something you really should know, just for safety's sake. So what's the rate at which they tell you to drink, to not go over this rate? Yeah, it's one an hour. Yeah. So the, the, all of the alcoholic drinks, the, the, the dosing, like it's a six-ounce glass of wine or 12-ounce beer, you know, there's... 
there's less alcohol per volume of a beer, so it's 12 ounces for beer and six ounces for wine, and you can metabolize that and eliminate it on a rate of about one of those drinks per hour, and that will keep you below the legal limit. Okay. Now, it's body mass dependent, right? We saw the kilogram there. So, tiny little, you know, 90-pound cheerleader <laughs> may want to drink a little slower than that. <laughs> okay. And a, and a football player, you know, the offensive lineman or something, you never know. Um, but they might be able to handle a little bit more, but again, it's probably not a good idea to bank on just your body mass. And, and so that's your rule of thumb. And I've got a nice little calculator, this little slide thing that the health center passed out that talked about you put in body mass and the number of drinks and the time. It's like a little slide rule, and it tells you what your uh, blood alcohol content is. And so you can use that to figure out, okay, am I illegal or not? Like somebody's going to be drunk and pull us out of the car. Let me see. What are you doing? Just a minute. <laughs> Give me your keys. No, I'm good. If I can work this, I can drive. No. <laughs> but it tells you, you know, whether you're legal or not. But again, based on that. But that, that does have the body mass in there, so you can put your weight in there. Um, and I've tested it around. It's like, okay, if I have six drinks and this and that. And, and it is about one drink an hour, even using that little calculator for my weight. These are the biological half lives So we have data on these things. If you're exposed to mercury, okay, right here is mercury. And it can be detected in the blood. The, the half-life is about one week. So it takes about a week for my mercury concentration in my blood to drop to half of what it was. But it does go away, okay? And so look at this one, polychlorinated biphenyls. Remember I told you that? Yeah. Ten years. Yeah. <laughs> A cadmium, more than 10 years. So, and cadmium is bad. I mean, it's not only is it going to hurt you, but it's going to be around a while. Uh, and then urine, the half life uh, is one week here, detectable in the urine. Uh, let's see. Too fast to sample. Dichloromethane, styrene, not polystyrene, that's like plastic, but uh, dichloromethane and styrene, styrene, the molecule, uh, before it's polymerized, one hour. Okay, so you'd have to get a lot of dichloromethane in your body to have a physiological effect or even a toxic effect. Toxin is the dose. Um, and it would be acute poisoning, but then it's going to be eliminated if you're conscious and urinating, etc. But that would be detectable in the blood. Um, dichloromethane, actually trichloroethene, TCE, was a miracle drug. And now it's just a solvent. We use it for dry cleaning and other things. Um, but it was a miracle drug because it was an in inhalant, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, an anesthetic. So for childbirth, they would let them breathe this trichloroethylene to take away the pain of childbirth. It was revolutionary. It's like one of the very first um, anesthetics used in, in such a common procedure of childbirth. And so it's like dichloromethane, it's eliminated very quickly. And a lot of times just through breath, you breathe it back out. Okay, so they pretty much put this solvent into this mother, she gives birth and they take it away and then it eventually goes away. But you think, that sounds crazy. Trichloroethene, it's chlorinated solvent, what about the baby, you know? Um, but again, the thing is, it's eliminated so quickly as well. So it leaves you and the baby uh, quickly. I still don't think it's a great idea, but hey, you know, that's, that was a long time ago. There's all these other different kinds of compounds, toluene, carbon monoxide. So here's carbon monoxide, 10 hours. That's kind of a long time. And, yeah. So it's kind of an interesting plot. This is from a handbook of occupational hazards. Let's talk about toxicological treatment. When I say the toxin is the dose, there are different levels of toxic effects. A lot of times we focus on the low, low levels here that when we're talking about effect, you have to define the effect. And in this case, the biological effect is death. So if you're below these levels, you won't see death. You start to see in super sensitive individuals this lowest observed effect level. And that's looking like it's around 45% of the percent lethal dose. At 50% lethal dose, 
that's the LD50, and it's expected that 50% of the population exposed to that level will die. Now, this is where it gets troubling. Whenever we do these toxicological studies, we use animal models. So this would be a mouse or a rabbit or something of that sort. And so they do test them with these drugs, and they fit them to this S-curve. And they say, wow, rabbits above this, you know, this dose and above all died. Rabbits below here, one or two died. Then now here, none of them died. And so then they fit this S-curve, and they come up with the LD50. And so then you also have models that they would apply to similar types of molecules. So not everything is animal tested. They say, well, this molecule is so similar to that molecule, and we know the LD50 for that molecule, so we'll apply it to this one. But that's... Uh, it's not quite rock solid. If you really want rock solid toxicology, you would do an animal model. The, for human health, you'd use a mammal. You'd need a mouse or a rabbit. Uh, but they also do starlings, they do birds, uh, they'll do different kinds of animals to determine the toxicological levels for these different substances. But this is, would be one where the, where the effect, the biological effect would be death. And then up here you have the Frank effect level Poor Frank. You know, so uh, that would be expected death. So it's you know it's only like fifty. Let's see, sixty seven. So sixty percent. You know, of a hundred percent lethal dose. You know, so if you go past the LD fifty by a small amount, I mean it's it's a steep curve. If you get two or three times the LD fifty, it's it's a, it's a bad situation. This, this researcher, she dropped dimethylmercury on her latex glove, and it went through the glove and went through her skin. And she did the calculations, and she knew she'd received a lethal dose. It took her months to die. So it doesn't necessarily happen right away. But it's just you've got the dose, and your body has to metabolize it and eliminate it. And they tried chelation therapy. They put... EDTA in her body to try to pull that mercury out, but enough of it got in there and it messed up her central nervous system and she eventually died. Yeah. So that's, that's an extreme example of uh, prolonged death after being able to calculate what the dose was. And that's it's one of the most horrific examples, but also one that I use because that shows that glove selection is really important. Uh, because latex gloves are useless against any organic substance. Okay, that it's natural rubber and solvents go right through it. Okay, whereas nitrile gloves are much better. So, so use nitrile gloves. Then you have hypersensitivity and accumulation. So these are allergies. Where you say the toxin is the dose, yes, that's true, the toxin is the dose, but sometimes your body amplifies that dose. Your body goes berserk, and that's what a hypersensitivity would be. These proteins, these tiny little proteins, the dose is nanograms, maybe, of a protein from a peanut, or my sister who has an extreme gluten allergy, that tiny little bit of gluten protein is enough to send her body into orbit. Okay, And so... Her, it's her body doing that. So in that case, it's not necessarily the dose of the toxin. I mean, there's still some small amount. She gets over a window, and then all of a sudden her body takes off with this physiological response. And then there's accumulation. We talked about mercury and cadmium. Those can be accumulated in the body. Hopefully those are not uh, acutely toxic, but, but we really have a difficult time understanding chronic effects. So what is the effect of uh, 10 years of having a tiny little dose of cadmium in your body? We know what acute poisoning is. Those are easy to study. We do animal studies for toxicological reasons. But, uh, but chronic exposure? How would you know that chronic exposure to your drinking water and your well is what caused your cancer and not hot dogs? Right? Or when, uh, some other environmental factor that you lived with your whole life. It's really difficult to nail down these chronic uh, exposures. So when I say the toxin is the dose, I'm talking about acute poisoning. And then radiation doses, you, we could talk about this a little bit. Radiation is not a chemical poison, but yet still the toxin is the dose. So getting a large dose of radiation 
you're not getting a chemical. Your body's not responding to a chemical, but your body is dealing with the damage. So think about radiation as a sunburn. The sun's not giving you any chemicals, but yet you can run a fever. You can get a secondary infection if you have blisters. And so that sun has uh, damaged your tissues on the outside of your body, and you get swelling, you get uh, redness because the capillaries have opened up to try to take away the heat. And then in extreme cases, you've killed enough cells that then you start to get blistering. And so that's the body just taking apart those cells and metabolizing the damaged cells. So your body is metabolizing something and eliminating something. It's eliminating the, the results of the dead tissue. So that takes time. So you, again, you have this sort of do dose response. You have sunburn and a recovery. Well, uh, <clears throat> ionizing radiation may not stop at your skin. It can happen internally. So it's just like an internal sunburn. It can damage your organs and your body has to dismantle the dead cells, metabolize them through the liver and so on and eliminate them through the kidneys. And so your body can handle a certain amount of radiation. You shouldn't be afraid of it but acute radiation is, is a problem because your body has, is just overwhelmed. <clears throat> and so there's just some of the units for radiation. The point is we, we have a threshold level below which our body can handle. There's no detectable effects for up to 25 rem. But you get up to 500 rem, that's, that's the LD50 for radiation. So this REM dose is a, what they call a Rentgen equivalent of man. It's the type of radiation that can be absorbed by the components of your body. Um, at super high energy radiation, it goes right through and you don't really absorb any. So you didn't really get a dose. This is only the stuff that's absorbable by tissue. And that's what they're using to calculate the REM dose. If you get less than LD50, you can still see nausea and decrease in white blood cells. Um, and then you can get an increase in white blood cells if you have a smaller dose than that. That's just like a, a sunburn. In fact, you can see the same effect with a sunburn. <clears throat> uh, power plants and, and nuclear facilities have their employees wear film badges because radioactivity will expose film. And so they'll just have a little piece of film in a badge, and you'll see this at the hospital for the rad techs. They'll have uh, film badges, and some of them wear rings. You know, when they're positioning things, if the... If the um, somebody hit the button or something malfunctioned and the x-ray tube came on while their hands are in the area, that's going to be the place that's exposed. And so some of them will wear a film ring. Why is that? It's not going to stop them from getting exposed, but they want to know what their dose was. And so if they get blasted in their hands, then they're going to send that ring off and get it developed. And they develop the film and look at how dark it is, and the darkness of the exposed film will tell them how much radiation they got. So... Um, now they pull, pull them off. So you have a red tech, they got exposed, their film badge tells them that they got, uh, say, one rem. That's okay. It's below the detectable clinical effects. So they're probably not going to receive any damage from that, or their body can handle the damage that occurred. But they will be pulled off their job till the end of the year, whether fiscal year or calendar year. Because what they do is they will they will have a maximum of 0.5 rem per year for 500 millirem per year to keep them safe. And so if you're dealing with radiation, you have this what they call administrative limit. This over here is the physiological limit. That's the limit of your body. And so your employer says, we don't want to go anywhere near that limit. Let's back off and set an administrative limit so that anybody that's received half a rem in a one-year period is going to be reassigned to other duties. They're not fired, but they're just going to be pulled off the radioactive activities until the year is up, and then they can go back to work in that job. And it's called being burned up. It's pretty rare that it happens, but it does happen on occasion. Someone gets burned up, they get pulled off their job. Uh, the um, photographers for the Manhattan Project and all of those atomic tests uh, since the Manhattan Project would get burned up Let's say they were working on a, like a um, August 1st, you know, type fiscal year. They said, we'd get to June and we'd be burned up. <laughs> so they'd have 500 millirem in, you know, taking photographs of the nuclear detonations. And then when they got to 500 millirem, they would be pulled off and like go develop film or something. They wouldn't be able to go photograph 
stuff. So uh, the reason I know that is because these guys had a 60th year reunion and they were all there on camera talking about their experiences. So these guys, after filming hundreds of nuclear detonations, had a 60 year reunion. <laughs> they were all 80 and 90 years old and talking about their experiences. And they were able to live to 80 and 90 because of these administrative limits. You know, we were paying attention, make sure they didn't continue to work in a radioactive environment. So I just put the little radioactive piece in there um, just to kind of show the differences between a drug and radioactivity. It's going to be very difficult to detect in a crime situation uh, radioactive material in terms of physiological evidence. Like I said, it's like a sunburn. What kind of physiological evidence would there be in the bloodstream or whatever? You would have enzymes, liver enzymes, that were related to taking apart the dead tissue. But it'd be hard to say this was radiation sickness. You'd have to really dig deeply to figure out what that was. But evidence coming in the door, you should have a radiation detector. You should be able to tell if something's radioactive. This does show up. There was a Boy Scout, they call him the, the, radio, the Atomic Boy Scout. He learned that smoke detectors had radioactive sources in them. And so in his little shed, his little workshop in the backyard, he started dissolving the americium out of these smoke detectors with nitric acid. And he had radioactivity everywhere. He started like showing symptoms of radiation sickness. And so then they pulled, investigated, and his parents said, we don't know what he does back there. They go back there with the Geiger counters, and there's radioactivity everywhere. They backed away, and it became a super fun site. Like for the EPA, to spend all this federal money to clean up this kid's shed in their backyard because there was radioactivity everywhere. So um, you never know what you're going to run into, and that might be something. It's not a drug, but it might be a piece of evidence that you run into. Cool. This job is not dull, <laughs> which is probably why you like it.